I don't think it's true that political outcomes in the West, the Brexit vote, the election of Trump, were in any significant way influenced by um, bot farms, by the manipulation of social media. That's a conspiracy theory. And the fact that the progressive left believe it's conspiracy... Theory, it's, just it's, not, fact. it's not conspiracy theory. Right, let, 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 let me finish. Let me finish. are being placed finish, right? by various groups to achieve change. Yeah. Now, they may be wrong they, in their judgment, but it's not a conspiracy to say it is happening. Can, can no, it will be. Roger, Roger. So I was, I was prone to believe this. And I wrote something to this effect, reporting on this, saying, this is really interesting work. You should read this. An ex-Google software engineer who was tasked by Google with looking into, in depth, whether uh, social media like Twitter, like Facebook, were being manipulated by bot farms, either in Russia or China, looked into it in great depth, said, there's nothing to it, Toby. Don't believe it. It's a conspiracy theory. It's Guys, a left- heard it here first. In Toby, Google Cambridge Analytica have no yeah. idea what they're talking about. Cambridge Analytica are just a conspiracy theory, guys. Toby Young has got the scoop for you today. For God's sake, seriously. I think we all agree that we're in a, a polarised moment, that, that there is a high degree of intolerance. And I just want to ask whether you feel that this is going to get worse or is it going to get better? If it's going to get better, how does it get better? What do we do? Miriam, please start. Oh, thank you. Um, so um, I think it's got to get wor- It's going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, and I think we are slowly uh, reaching breaking point, in my opinion. I think that there's a growing uh, movement, uh, even among uh, the young people that um, Toby would uh, mischaracterize as Generation Woke, um, who, who really uh, do not identify with the polarization that's currently happening, that, that, that don't necessarily uh, agree with uh, certain views, but definitely think that they should be heard and, um, and find it quite uncomfortable that there's a situation now where there are uh, views that uh, are being uh, sort of marginalized to the point where they're no longer being allowed to express, particularly on debates that might be um, quite new, uh, quite um, important to, uh, you know, the, the, the future of our society. And so I think that there, that voice is growing. I see it growing. Um, and I think that that's the voice that will eventually um, take the lead on this issue. And, and what that lead is, is essentially saying this, look, um, disagreeing with someone is uh, a really important part of the democratic principles that we most of us in this society uh, subscribe to and so we've got to figure out mechanisms in order to protect that having said that there are obviously issues that are going to be deeply uh, emotive and maybe the question is and i've said this before in my work is that you know emotion is a fuel for change, but it isn't a framework. And the conversations we have to have are around the frameworks for change. So yes, you're allowed to feel anger, you're allowed to feel sadness, you're allowed to feel enraged, but that can't be how you enter a conversation, just like in your personal life, when you're feeling super annoyed, super frazzled, is not the best time to go and speak to your partner about the issue that you know, you're having a disagreement about, right? Same goes for society. We're allowed to feel those emotions, but we need to find spaces in which those emotions are somewhat uh, placated in order to allow us to focus on the frameworks which can allow for a conversation that allows us to move forward. And I think there is, um, contrary to what is uh, regularly uh, peddled on this issue, uh, a real recognition that it is voices on the margin which are, which make society advance and, and have done historically. Uh, and so we can't, we cannot drown those out. Um, and now I, I just think that unfortunately a lot of the conversation around this issue is being pushed by people who actually deep down what they're resentful of is minorities finally being able to call out the majority stakeholders in our society. And that's what they're deep down a bit pissed off about. They're like, oh, how dare you come and um, challenge us? This is our monopoly over power. We, we hear that point. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Can I respond to, can I respond to that, Isabel? And respond to your question too. Um, just, just, just on the last point that Miriam made, um, the curious thing is, it isn't for the most part minorities um, uh, cancelling uh, white heterosexual middle aged men. It's younger heterosexual white people who are often more privileged than the people they cancel. So if you look at the outrage mob that formed on the New York Times and ended up getting Jim Bennett fired for having the audacity to publish an, a, a piece on the comment pages by a Republican senator, they weren't minorities. They were 
Ivy League educated, extremely privileged white people. And often being woke is a form of social signaling. It's a way of signaling your high status. Well, more broadly, I'd like to agree with Miriam. Uh, Miriam. I think it's true uh, that we need to hear um, uh, uh, we need to hear from disadvantaged groups. We need to hear from marginalized people. And the best way to hear from them is to stand up for free speech. The idea that there is a conflict between pale, male and stale conservatives like me and minorities when it comes to defending free speech is a false binary, a false opposition. It's in all of our interests. And the reason I say that is if you look at the history of the civil rights movement, of the gay rights movement, uh, even more recently of the trans rights movement, um, all of them have depended upon the hard-won uh, battles uh, fought by organizations like the ACLU in the 1960s to defend freedom of speech. The way to become less polarized is if we become more tolerant, more patient with those who we disagree with. Don't try and cancel them, which I'm afraid is okay. Generation Woke's go-to reaction. Let's listen to each other. Let's stand up for the right to free speech and bring everybody into the conversation. Roger, I want to bring you into the conversation. You've talked about uh, the need to return to tolerance or the need to have a tolerance of views and, and not go to ad hominem criticism. How do we do that in this, in this polarised moment? Well, I think that, you see, I'm, I'm really, I could, if I'm being optimistic in this terrible situation with COVID, I would say what COVID has actually demonstrated is that none of us is special, that we're all together in this. To a degree, some people can protect themselves with wealth a bit more, but not much. And I've noticed around, and maybe, a much greater sense of community, paradoxically, when you can't meet. So maybe the longer-term psychological impact of COVID and the way in which you know, it makes nationalist ideas of national independence ludicrous in many areas, uh, maybe we will see a greater forms of cooperation, a greater sense of society. But I think two things. One is it requires, requires three things, I, I would say. First of all, it requires universities and others to be much more robust. I agree with Toby on this. And you must not have no, we mustn't have no platforming. We must have the widest range of voices. At the same time, it's crystal clear that most of us are, and certainly people like me, are poorly informed about the reality of black lives and what happens, are poorly, informed, are poorly um, informed about colonialism. And there needs to be a course correction in teaching of history and other things to understand these issues. And I do think the third thing is that organizations like the BBC, which has flaws, must be ultimately protected as a place where you can have investigation before you have outrage. I mean, when Toby's going on about certain statistics about black white, this ought to be a matter of debate. It ought to be something that can be discovered because it's a fact. And when discovered, we should then look at possible wider explanations for the event. But we shouldn't be arguing backwards and forwards that if he, he says it, it can't be true because he's white, or they say it must be true because they're black. Surely there's still a vast role for sensible, straightforward journalism to establish the facts about, and then we, then we disagree about causes, then we disagree about solutions, but we don't spend our time disputing facts. But isn't that one of the characteristics of this, for, of this kind of polarization, the alternative facts argument? After all, we don't, disagree, we don't agree on the facts. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.